So welcome everyone to the Laboratory Church. Our mission, as you could probably recite by now, is to experiment together to build beloved community and creative worship, as well as brave spaces to heal from trauma together. You can feel free to download our worship bulletin from the link in the chat room, which I will post again when I get back to that screen. And I also wanted to tell you about a poor people's campaign action tomorrow uh, with Reverend Dr. Barber. I will post the link to sign up for that also in the chat. And that starts tomorrow at 5.30 PM. And it gives information about how you can also post on social media. I, for example, posted it earlier today. So that is part of the way that you can help. I think all of you know our trauma statement by now. But just in case you don't, please feel free to add your pronouns. And as a content and trigger warning, I did want to let you know that I will be talking about the history of our country in my sermon. And that will talk a little bit about slavery, white supremacy, and indigenous murder. As always, if you need any kind of assistance, if you need to walk away for a second while I say that and come back, that's okay. We would ask you to stay at the end in case you need to process anything because we are here for that as well. So we light these candles as a symbol of entering a sacred space together with the fire of the Holy Spirit as our guide and medium. I call in radiant healing light to surround us as we enter sacred space together. Breathe deeply, gently, slowly, allowing yourself to relax into this moment now. Breathing slowly, deeply, gently. Feel yourself beginning to let go. Muscles relaxing, tension releasing, body softening. Breathe deeply. Gently, slowly. Focus your awareness in your heart center. Allow yourself to accept uncertainty. Give yourself permission to surrender the need to control things, situations, people. Breathe deeply, gently, slowly, and trust. Trust your process. Trust the hand that you cannot see that guides your life. Have faith in the higher power and the divine plan for your life. Breathe deeply, gently, slowly, and have faith. In the darkness, you see with your heart Take a deep, cleansing, calming breath and open your heart, connecting with source. Allow your heart to guide you with love through uncertainty, through challenges, through pain. Breathe deeply, gently, slowly. 
allowing your faith to strengthen. Allow your faith to strengthen. Know that this too shall pass. Breathing deeply, gently, slowly. Choose the path of love, the path of the heart. Remember, you are guided and supported in the light. Even when you cannot feel it or see it. Breathe deeply, gently, slowly. You are one step closer each moment in your journey. Breathe and believe. Surrender the stress. Breathe and believe. Surrender the worry and anxiety. Breathe and believe. Find courage and hope. Breathe and believe. Find strength in faith. Breathe and believe. Find peace in true unconditional love. Breathe and believe in the divine master plan. And so it is. Thank you for joining me on this journey and making time to love yourself. And we will now join Thaddeus as he gives the mental health Thank you for that. <clears throat> that was very centering, very relaxing as usual. And I hold the suggestion to trust the hand that we cannot see. And in that spirit, uh, today's message is on the shield of faith. And I'd like to start out just by greeting you with peace and asking the question, what is the shield of faith and how does it protect our mental health? So if we look at John 20, 29, Jesus said to them, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. So that sounds to me like faith is a mentality. It's a mindful orientation. It's much more than that, but it also gives us something to hold on to when things are particularly difficult. And we know that in recent times, things have just been plain old hard. Faith has a way of comforting the troubled heart and mind and redirecting us and that redirection by faith is actually expressed in the mental health field um, in the same way of redirecting the mind and the focus to something that may be more useful. So just to clarify, I'm not speaking about religious practices when I talk about this particular faith. Uh, what I'm talking about here today is the faith that's spoken about as the tiny mustard seed, right? In the, in the beginning was the word. And so now hold on, I started out talking about faith and now I'm talking about words. Why am I doing that? That's a good question. Well, what I'm suggesting here today is that your words are actually seeds in the universe. 
And it only takes a small amount of word to produce in this universal environment. And when God said in the beginning, let there be light, that was a demonstration of faith. That was a demonstration that God stood on the conviction that light would be organized and appear. Now we too can create reality by directing our thoughts and our words in a faithful direction. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse one, it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. Now, the thing that we actually are hoping for when we stand on this sea of faith is actually the DNA of that thing that you're manifesting. And just as when we take a small seed and plant it in the dirt in our garden, our words function in quite the same way because we are of a creative being and our words have creative potential. So when we came together, we said, let there be a laboratory church. And from that little seed, here we are. And who knows how far and how wide the potential is that's possessed inside of that seed. So when we refocus on God's energy and we keep our minds stayed there, that shield, that faith, and speaking words of faith, this practice cancels out the attack and any weapon that's formed against you. Until we meet again, God's grace and peace. Thank you, Thaddeus. Now Jill will lead us in our scripture reading for today. I'll be reading from Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, Put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Will you join with me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you. For you are our rock, our shield, and our redeemer. Amen. 
So I'm going to start with a review of the last time before I get into the introduction of the shield of faith. So we began our focus on the armor of God with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We did this due to the nature of discerning the interpretation of the biblical texts and the way that they have often been misused. Next, we focused on the helmet of salvation, because like the word of God, there is a lot to unpack in its meaning, including our tendency culturally to focus on the fear of hell rather than the joy of liberation and living in loving ways. Today, I am going to begin to unpack what it means to take up the shield of faith. The word for shield used here is the Greek word thurios. And it, this shield is not the tiny shield that, you know, you just have like, like this that you maybe see in um, medieval times, but properly it's an oblong ancient Roman shield, which looked like a full door. And it was large enough to provide full body protection from attack. In this context, it refers to God's in working of faith, which protects the whole believer, covering their whole person in spiritual warfare. God's self is our shield, as we can read in Psalm 710 where it says, God is my shield who saves the upright in heart. God does this by providing protection with the inbirth of God's spoken word of faith into the believer. This takes the fire out of the attacks of the evil one. Author Hope Bollinger puts it this way. We hold on to our faith like a shield. We have to deliberately choose faith in all circumstances. That means when we encounter doubts or when we find a passage of scripture that troubles us, that we choose to hold on to faith. She further describes how this works in a community sense when she says, the shield does a lot more than take blows from arrows. The typical Roman shield could push back against the enemy, and when soldiers clumped together, they could form a protective barrier, also known as the phalanx formation. But what does that mean? If faith is a gift from God and not something we can produce ourselves, it can be tricky to understand and even to believe. I interpret the need to take up the shield of faith as a way to acknowledge that very mystery and that sometimes we must trust and have faith in God even when we don't believe that change is possible. Now, the flaming arrows represent doubt, such as questions about whether God really can work through this mess and make love win. These arrows might also represent anything that impedes our spiritual growth, such as serving fear or other worldly fruit. This passage suggests that no matter what arrows evil uses to attack us, we need to take up the shield of faith to protect ourselves from these assaults. Now, this is a spiritual battle, and we need spiritual protection to survive the assaults on our minds and bodies as well. This goes back to the Holy Spirit and her fruit, which is intricately tied to the armor of God. When we take up the shield of faith and we put on the helmet of salvation and discern how to use the word of God, we will always produce spirit fruit. So what are the arrows of our time? If fear and doubt are some of the flaming arrows, 
what might be fueling those arrows in our cultural context. I am naming today that it is the dehumanizing oppression of most people under our economic and cultural systems of scarcity and greed. How many people in this country work full-time and or multiple part-time jobs and work ridiculous numbers of hours, often well over 60 hours per week, and still don't make enough money to get by? Do any of you believe that God intended it to be this way? In my lifetime, I have been fortunate to have lived and traveled around the world and across most of our country, but not in any luxurious sense. These travels showed me both what is possible when we disregard our greed and false pr priorities and what happens when we don't. While I in no way glorify poverty nor underestimate its deadliness and disease, what I have seen is that God dwells in poor communities and is always on their side. I've also noticed that the less people have, the more they typically share with one another and the more they look out for one another. Yet in the reverse, the more people have, the less they typically share with one another. I have seen people across the world living in urban communities of makeshift tents and shacks made out of billboard signs and corrugated metal that is from scrap yards with dirt floors and no electricity nor running water and in those places, even I, who is seen as a rich person, have been offered food and hospitality. The same has happened in remote villages and in poorer communities in this country. The level of compassion from those who are already struggling and, and who are usually demeaned as being lazy or subhuman because they're monetarily poor is actually a total conviction against our idolization of the rich and powerful. We have been sold the American myth. I said that intentionally, the American myth that if we work hard, we will be rich someday. And so many of us have sold our souls to jobs that ultimately consume and destroy God's resources. And for what? The ability to buy stuff we don't need, all while fueling the powers and principalities that cause poverty in the first place? The middle class, the middle class in this country was created as a weapon against the poor. You heard me right. It was intentional. Much like white people and white supremacy was created to be weaponized against people of color. With that statement, I do need to give a brief history lesson, especially in light of Juneteenth yesterday. Now to learn more about what I'm about to summarize for you, please read Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. It will change your perspective in ways that I can't even begin to do in this sermon. Since the moment Europeans stepped foot in this land, the horrors of oppression began. Prior to our arrival, the indigenous people of this land were communal, and they did not believe in any concept of owning the land upon which they lived. 
Instead, they worked and lived on the land in a sustainable and respectful way because they knew it was a gift. And they did this for the good of their entire communities without competition and separation. I am sure they still had difficulties because humans have difficulties, but the cultural values were much healthier and more inclusive. But when rich European men came, they claimed this land as their own and recreated the caste system they brought with them. Because they now owned it, and enforce their belief of owning it with weapons, anyone else who came over or who were already here had to work for these new landowners to get by. At one point, when these workers of different skin tones and different cultures began to unite against such injustice, guess what was created? Racism, and the white middle class. Now, this is also what was the start of the horrors of chattel slavery. Because these workers had united for a brief time and dared to demand dignity along with their fair share of the fruit of their labor, the rich European men created the concept of race and called folks with their lighter skin tones as the superior race and said, hey, if you police those other people, you can have more money and even a teeny tiny piece of land for yourself and your family, middle class. But because their greed knew no bounds, and these folks still all spoke the same language, this meant that there was a risk for future cooperation. So they had to kidnap people from Africa who did not share their language. They labeled these human beings savages and forced them into hard labor because they didn't speak the language and had been ripped from their families and land, stripped of their health, humanity, and history during deadly passages across the Atlantic, they were treated as animals. They had already storied the indigenous people of this land as savages, but because these indigenous people were here first, and knew the land as well as their value and history, the colonizers had to murder as many of them as they could in order to control those who remained. This was their attempt to justify stealing the land they had no business stealing in the first place. The process of dehumanization and creating others through lies and manipulation of narratives is the first trick in dividing and conquering God's people. That is followed by the process of forcing the internalization of these lies through the threat of violence and murder to keep it from being questioned and to keep it in place. Okay. I know that's hard to hear and that is quite a lot. So I'm gonna pause for a second and ask you, is everybody okay? Can you give me thumbs up? Okay. Now, if you're not totally okay and you want to stay after to talk about it, please remember that we are here to do that. So now I'm gonna come back to the present with that history in mind we continue to see the evil that has grown and spread as a result of our oppressive history and the ways that our economy continues to demean and dehumanize whole segments of the world's population for the gain of the few. 
So what does picking up the shield of faith look like in this context? When the fiery darts have grown into a fire that seems intent on burning up the whole world. Much like the plague of lo locusts that I mentioned in the study lab, by the way. So the good news is, is that I think there's a way that we can contribute to stopping this plague. I suggest that we start by changing our priorities. We each need to look at the gifts and talents that God blessed us with and begin to discern how we are intended to use them to serve all of God's people and creation rather than use them to find the best job with the most money which fuels gross consumerism and competition with our neighbors. I have faith that if we each took up God's commandment of love, to love our neighbors as ourselves, and to use our gifts for this purpose, no one would ever be without food and shelter. If we use this shield of faith to fuel our ability to choose love over fear, believing that God intends only the best for us, the enemy will be pushed back. And as we come together with our shields of faith, we become an even more powerful force that just as in that balance of soldiers refutes the lies of the enemy and pushes him back even further. Now, given the way we've all been enculturated, it is scary to trust that God will provide for us even if we don't work a normal job that society tells us we have to have to pay our bills. And each time we choose our purpose work of love and rely on the faith that God is ultimately going to use our gifts and talents for the abundance of all, we inspire the next person to join our ranks. And as the more join our ranks, it is easier to pick up the shield and remember that God's way of love will win despite the temporary setbacks that we face along the way. We are stronger together and God always calls us into community. I've said in previous sermons that Christ's example is in community. It requires faith to choose to live by the fruit of the spirit over the fear of this world. And with that faith, God's realm will fully be manifested. So in closing, I would like to share a story with you that I feel certain you probably have heard. And it goes like this. Once upon a time, there was a great famine. The people in one small village didn't have enough to eat and definitely didn't have enough to store for the winter. People were terrified that their families would go hungry. So the tiny bits of food that they did have, they hid. They hid this food even from their friends and neighbors. One day, a wandering stranger came into the village. He asked the different people he met about finding a place to eat and sleep for the night. There's not a bite in the whole county, they told him. You better keep moving. Oh, I have everything I need, he said. In fact, I would like to make some stone soup to share with all of you. He pulled a big black cooking pot from his wagon. He filled it with water and built a fire under it. Then he reached slowly into his knapsack and while several villagers watched, he pulled a plain gray stone from a cloth bag 
and dropped it in the water. By now, hearing about this magic stone, most of the villagers were surrounding him and his cooking pot. As he sniffed the stone soup and licked his lips, the villagers began to overcome their lack of trust. Ah, the stranger said aloud to himself, I do like a tasty, so a tasty stone soup. Of course, stone soup with cabbage is even better. Soon a villager ran from his house into the village square holding a cabbage. I have this cabbage from my garden, he said, as he held it out to the stranger. Fantastic, cried the stranger. He then cut up the cabbage and added it to the pot. You know, I once had stone soup with cabbage and a little bit of beef, and it was delicious. The butcher then said that he thought he could probably find some beef scraps. As he ran back to his shops, other villagers offered bits of vegetables from their own gardens, potatoes, onions, carrots, and celery. Soon the big black pot was bubbling and steaming. When the soup was ready, everyone in the village ate a bowl of soup and it was delicious. The villagers declared that the stone must have been magic and wanted to know where they could get one too, because surely this one was used up. The stranger then took the stone out of the pot and threw it on the ground with other stones. And it was then that they realized that the stone had not been magic at all. And instead, they had simply learned to share. And in sharing, each one of them had enough. We now enter our time of offering and prayer and Jill will lead us. Well, I just wanted to share a few moments about the ingredients of our own stone soup that we have planted in our community. And despite all the struggles of this past year, um, we've launched ministries to support our community through gardens, a food pantry, mentoring, and that alone would be an accomplishment that we got those off the ground, but these also have been growing. So we want to continue that momentum. And we hope that you can support those ministries with your prayers, if you can volunteer, or if possible, your financial support. And we know the lasting impact that this can have because we've experienced it with the Four Keeps Mobile Food Pantry in that we're starting now to see some familiar faces and very grateful faces. And word is spreading out of our presence on the Mondays that we're there within the community. So please take a moment as you see on the screen or if you can go online on our website, um, it gives you the links and ways in which you can provide the offering. So if you'll take a moment and pray with me. Lord, we are grateful. We're grateful for your love and protection. We are grateful for our health during a pandemic. We are grateful for this church community and its missions. We are grateful for our gifts to serve you and give back. We are grateful. Amen. You will now join our time of communion, which Ellen, Reverend Ellen Corcella will lead us in. We are so happy to have her back. And so if you need a moment to gather your 
bread and wine or your crackers and juice or whatever it is, please feel free. Yes, let us begin to set the table together of our sharing in communion. I see, I have our, there are switch views so I can see who's with us and who's got stuff ready, okay. So I offer that uh, in thinking about the sermon and where we are in the gospel and our mental health moment, that Jesus, in fact, gave his own words of faith on the night before he died. His words included his instructions to his disciples to go out and prepare a place for them. They included putting a meal together and sharing it together. And they included these remarkable words, do this in remembrance of me. Did Jesus know when he said that, that centuries later we would still be doing that in remembrance of him? Because that is a remarkable fact and a testament of faith across the ages, as well as our faith today. And what he did was create a ritual where we gather in community and community becomes our shield of faith. And as Jill noted, even in a small community, when we put our souls and faith together, we can use that shields to move out into literally our world and offer something different, something nourishing, something joyous to others at all times. So I ask you today to join with me as we reenact those last words where Jesus took a piece of bread and he blessed it and he broke it saying to his followers, this is a bread of life. Share this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the wine and he blessed it as well. And he lifted the wine to his disciples and he said to them, drink this as the cup of blessing that comes from my blood and my sacrifice to keep this faith going. Do all of this in remembrance of me. Now for the prayer. Pray with me. Holy one, thank you for the seed of faith. Thank you for this expression that you've left us to come together in community, in an expression that reflects the body as a whole. Thank you for pulling us back from individualism and competition. Thank you for pulling us back to one another. Thank you for rejoining us over and over again when we get out of focus, when we forget. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your community. Thank you for your people. And thank you for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name. You may partake of the elements at this time. Now, will you join with me for the benediction? 
let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as challenges arise. Amen. Amen.